I didn't even, yeah. Scary. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Come on, gang. Find a good spot. Grab a cup of coffee. That was not an invitation to jump ship. There's this little thing called a networking event at the end of the day. I know it's uncomfortable, it's awkward. Find a new seat. It may or may not still be warm from the former app, uh, occupant. Okay, two more minutes. Two minutes to find a new seat, wiggle around, break in place. Okay, it's so good to know that all the leaders of this industry do not know how to follow directions. It's good. You're rule breakers. You're rule benders. I see people firmly saying, hell no, I will not move. We won't go. That's fine. Be that way. Be grumpy. That's okay. Oh, look, I see some people all the way across the room. That's good for you. Thank you. Way to lead by example. Okay, I see a few people that have, have tried to break out of their comfort zone. That's good. That's wonderful. Doesn't the world look different from your new location? Isn't it nice? You see something new? Okay, gang, come on back together. I know it was speedy, but we're going to get going. I, I know I've, uh, oh, there's still mu gentle music playing in the background. Is that music? The tone? Oh, it is music. Thank you. Okay, so I know I tried to introduce her twice because I lost my place. Huh? Oh, still getting mic'd. Okay, I'm gonna get, you've got a get out of jail free card for another 30 seconds. So find your seats. Is everybody having a little bit of fun? Reasonable amount of fun? Okay, that's good. So in the context of our conversation to wrap up the day, I am going to put a teaser out there um, towards the end that, that has a little bit of, of connectivity to um, you know, what we're talking about. It's, it's important to find organizations that can support and believe what you believe. And, and I'm lucky enough um, in one of my roles professionally to be the president of the VF Foundation, which is a, a 501c3 embedded within our corporation that that focuses on some of the work that we do. So I'm gonna put a little teaser out there that we may, may or may not have a little announcement for everybody in the room um, as we close out our day. So how's that for a teaser? Is that good enough? Is that sufficient? All right. Are the mics working? No, they're not working at all. You need, you need me to keep riffing, tell a joke? I'm, I'm running out really quick. Um, 
So I think the, the one thing that I do want to ask of, of everybody today, and we did the word cloud earlier, and collaboration was in the middle, and I suggested in that spirit that the next time you come to something like that, you extend an invitation to someone that ordinarily wouldn't be in the room. So I'm going to press on that for a hot minute. Did anybody think about that within your own network and ecosystem that, the, okay, I've got the person in mind. This is exactly who I want to bring to something like this. Did anybody do that? Yes, no, maybe so. Getting some blank stares, some head bobbles, Teresa, thank you. Okay. Did you also ask yourself the question, uh, how are we going to pay for that? <laughs> I know it always boils down to money, gang. The reason why I point that out, right, is that we all have these noble ideas often in this space. And the ideas are good, and the logic is sound, and the science is there. And then it boils down to this icky question of where the heck do the nickels come from? How do we drive and deliver on the financing of some of these components? And so again, as a teaser, I would argue and push for everyone, it can come in really unique ways. I, I often challenge our funding mechanisms in this space of conservation and stewardship that we think of it has to be this way or it has to be that way in order to drive and deliver on potential projects and programs. And so if you think about that and the commonality that we all share within that space, I've tried to bring some of these mind benders out to the table as we've gone through the day. And I'm going to continue to provide a call to action of can you think differently about who you talk to? I, one would never think that um, Goodyear could sponsor Taramahara Indians for a foot race in Colorado. But guess what happened after they heard the story of that foot race? And guess what that the tribal leader said to Goodyear after that foot race was done about, yeah, 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 fine, we get it, it's a marketing gimmick, but how about giving money back to our tribe back in Mexico? So never for a minute think that that group from that tribe went to Colorado to get a sponsorship from a tire company. That was not the main goal. But these things are possible if you expand your thinking and, and you, you challenge your horizons. So a little food for thought moving into your evening. All right, are the, mi are the microphones ready yet? Because that was it. That was literally all I have left. Okay. Wonderful. Well, here we go. So I try to introduce her twice. This is number two. So, she, so she's, uh, she's definitely had um, a little bit of introduction. But Dinah Baer, who's going to be joining us, is an attorney and consultant who has served 25 years as general counsel and deputy general counsel on the President's Council on Environmental Quality. So she has long been involved in border issues from both an environmental and humanitarian perspective, including work related to border barriers and to prevention of migrant deaths. And she now lives in Tucson, Arizona. So for the third time, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming to the stage Dinah Bear. Well, there's something about the third time is the charm. And I hope the mic is working OK after all that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to sincerely thank the Salazar Center for including the border wall as the topic for this symposium. Given the massive investment that American taxpayers have spent on this project, not to mention the prominent role it's, that it's played in politics, it's really rather astonishing how little dialogue there has been about this issue in a calm, uh, <laughs> measured public forum. This afternoon, I'm going to try and do three things quickly. Uh, first, just lay out a history of, a uh, very brief history of how we got to where we are today in terms of the border wall. Secondly, talk a bit about why I think this issue is particularly hard, harder than most hard issues in my experience. Uh, and third, end with a couple of examples of potentially uh, op uh, potential situations that may have a different and better outcome. In 1971, then First Lady Pat Nixon dedicated an area south of San Diego, now known as Friendship Park, that includes the site of the first boundary marker. She asked the Secret Service for some cutting shears, and she cut the, the barbed wire uh, 
that separated Mexico and the United States there and said, I hope there won't be a fence here too long. That area became a flashpoint of concern 25 years later when a congressman not from that district uh, came to believe that the Border Patrol was not able to adequately patrol that park. One of his staff people who came out from Washington, D.C. was told by an agent there that there was a mouse listed under the Endangered Species Act that restricted the ability to clear vegetation and thus hampered the uh, line of vision for the Border Patrol. That was not true. There was no endangered mouse or restriction under the Endangered Species Act. But that story helped to catalyze the passage of a law that allowed the waiver of the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act to construct 14 miles of border wall south of San Diego that Congress mandated. In 2005, Congress passed the Real ID Act and included a provision not asked for by the administration, I would add, uh, to allow the Secretary of Homeland Security to, quote, waive all legal requirements, such secretary and such secretary's discretion, sole discretion, determines necessary to ensure expeditious construction of border barriers and walls. No hearings were held on this provision. The Congressional Research Service was unable to identify any provision that was as broad as this one. To date, 84 federal laws and all related state and local laws on the same subject have been waived. These waivers are still in effect. In 2006, Congress passed the Secure Fence Act, mandating border barrier construction with specific geographic coordinates, which proved either an accurate or impossible, or in some cases, as I recall, in Mexico, um, so in 2008, the Consolidated Appropriations Act allowed the Secretary some discretion in where to build the wall, uh, but also mandated 700 miles of wall. By the end of 2008, 370 miles of 18-foot pedestrian wall and 300 miles of vehicle barrier had been constructed. Using the same authorizing authorities, along with the transfer of $9 billion from the Defense Department based on a declaration of a national emergency, the last administration constructed about 458 miles of new 30-foot wall, either replacing the 18-foot wall or constructing in new areas. Cumulatively, about 740 miles of pedestrian wall has been built with costs running as high as $46 million a mile. About $2.4 billion were spent between 2007 and 2009 for the 18-foot wall with estimated 15% annual operations and maintenance costs, that's from GAO. Roughly $15 billion for the Trump wall with no estimates of operations and maintenance. Thus, the initial construction cost, just the construction cost to date, the $17.5 billion equals the entire budget request for Customs and Border Protection for 65,000 Border Patrol agents and all of the other infrastructure for the entire fiscal year 2023. It's important to understand that along the entire border of Texas and in a short segment of Arizona, the wall is set back one or two miles into the United States because, of course, the border is in the middle of the river. Now the news is full of reports that both apprehensions and migrant deaths are at an all-time high. Between 2019 and 2021, there were 3,272 breaches of the wall. Who's counting? Uh, those were identified, uh, verified by CBP, and there are more every week. DHS has also reported that a well-constructed underground tunnel was built in, in one of the most fortified areas immediately under the border wall in California. 
well, I am from one border state and now live in another. Uh, I've spent much of my professional years, um, as mentioned, at the Co Council on Environmental Quality, which is a small agency in the Executive Office of the President in Washington, D.C. Virtually all of the issues that uh, CEQ is approached with are complex and challenging. But this issue has been, in my experience, perhaps the most challenging, extraordinarily difficult issue uh, certainly that I've ever uh, experienced. So, of course, I've given a little thought as to why. And I want to suggest three reasons that come to my mind, two of which have already been discussed uh, a fair amount by the first panel this morning. Um, so I will just mention them briefly. But the first one is the waiver of all laws. It's difficult to overstate the enormous effect of the waiver of laws and almost impossible to understate how little the public understands about this in a nation that identifies itself as being one that believes in the rule of law. All laws protecting tribal interests, procurement and contracting laws for those billions of dollars of contracts that, uh, to build the wall, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the Native American Religious Freedom Act, public land authorizations, all environmental laws at the federal, local, state, tribal, all laws have been waived. Generally, over the last few decades, people have come to expect that uh, if, the, if a federal agency is going to engage in a major project, there'll be advance notice of that. That is not the case here. It's not only the public that doesn't get notified. Federal land managers have sometimes found out about wall construction on land that they're supposed to be managing by driving down a road or seeing a drone photo. Year after year, uh, the General Accountability Office, GAO, the Congressional Research Service, and the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General's Office have issued report after report stating that there is no measurement of the effectiveness of the wall, uh, criticizing a number of elements about uh, the wall, and pointing out that there's been no alternatives analysis. That was uh, the subject of a report as recently as 2021 by the Inspector General. Alternatives analysis, of course, is a bedrock requirement of the now much waived National Environmental Policy Act. The waiver of laws has had, I believe, an adverse effect uh, on the, a, the agency itself, Customs and Border Protection, as well, of course, as the public and the land and waters and wildlife of the borderlands. CBP agents and their contractors are, of course, human beings despite some suspicion on the part of some of my colleagues at times. Uh, but telling a group of people that they don't have to follow the rules anymore generally does not lead to a lot of good behavior. To be clear, not all the agents like the waiver. Uh, one agent said to me, it makes it look like we can't do our job like other agencies, like the military services, for example, which do follow the laws. The waivers have certainly alienated much of the affected public, tribes, land managers, and in my view is re responsible for certainly some of the on the ground damage to the land, to border patrol assets themselves, including the wall, uh, quite a bit of damage that could have been avoided even if it was going to be constructed uh, if there had been compliance with the laws that would usually apply to a project of this magnitude. The second reason I think this is particularly challenging, besides the fact that essentially the rule book has been totally thrown out, is the image of the borderlands, subtitled Blood and Dirt, and this is something the first panel mentioned too. The image of the borderlands has so drastically changed in other parts of the country. I started working on this while I was still on the East Coast, and I have a lot of friends in the Midwest. Um, back in the 19, in the first part of the 20th century, 
The borderlands were seen as an interesting, intriguing place, whether it was from a scientific or cultural or a tourist or even a health point of view. Saw a railroad uh, poster saying, visit the beautiful borderlands. Today, every visitor I know from another part of the country who has come to the borderlands is astonished that there are plants and animals down there in the desert, which they thought there wasn't anything at all. Um, when my husband and I moved to Tucson, which is not really right on the border, but friends back east actually were worried, seriously worried about our safety, even though <laughs> most border areas, certainly Tucson, but also Nogales and many other border areas are so much safer than where we were living in Washington, D.C., and nobody's calling out the National Guard there. A congressman from a non-border state, <laughs> actually in the middle of the country, captured this dynamic perfectly at a congressional hearing that I attended a few years ago. On a very large screen during the hearing, he showed a picture of a severed head in dirt, lying in dirt. The scene was not taken, as you can imagine, in the United States, but that was the message. This image of the borderlands is so very, very wrong. It's as though the public image of the Grand Canyon shifted from one of awe and beauty to thinking that the canyon was just a dangerous place that was good for nothing but a landfill. Reason number three. You've all heard the expression, all politics is local. And there's a lot of truth to that. But the border wall has been a huge exception to this rule. Time and time again, the shots on this issue are not called by borderland residents, but by people north of the border in other parts of the country. In fact, many local governments at the border, the county I live in, Pima County, many communities up and down the border, have passed resolutions against the border wall and lobbied against it. But in talking to members of Congress, I've had, for example, a senator say, you just don't know how afraid my colleagues are of this issue. The chief of staff to a senior senator said to me once, you're talking facts. This is just a political issue. A House member motioned with his hands you may have some valid points, but here are the letters I get from state in Midwest begging for the wall to be built. As a rancher on the border in southeast Arizona has often said, quote, every foot north of the border that you go, the support for the border wall grows. He is right. That is not to say, of course, that everybody on the border opposes the, the wall. That would not be true. But clearly the most opposition to the wall is from the borderlands, including from residents who do care about sa their safety and security and who see the wall as a very dangerous diversion from that goal while doing a lot of destruction. In the past few months, uh, there have been actually almost weeks, but I guess by now a couple of months, there have been two glimmers of hope that may possibly show that the rule about local politics isn't totally broken. Both of these glimmers involve urban areas and bi-national initiatives, where local residents and local governments have come together against some very formidable odds to work toward a different solution than the border wall. One which was alluded to by Deputy Secretary Tony Tommy Pedro this morning is in Laredo. Laredo was scheduled to have 69 more miles of border wall built. The Border Patrol had already started a process on that. And to be clear, if you're thinking, but this administration said they weren't going to build more wall. That's true, they did. However, they said, uh, as allowed by law, there is still remaining border wall funds. They have been asking Congress to rescind those funds. Congress has not done it. So they began the process of uh, working towards 69 more miles in the Laredo sector. 
that was canceled this summer and those funds are being transferred to other kinds of projects, uh, also dealing with border wall, but not in the Laredo sector. What's happened instead is they're encouraged by Ambassador Salazar, the local congressman, who unfortunately is on the Appropriations Committee in the House, and Mexican leaders, there's a plan for a 6.2 mile, 1,000 acre binational park, uh, the Dos Laredo to Laredo uh, binational park. There is already $2 million in fiscal year 2023 funding in uh, appropriations in Congress, and I understand that Mexico has committed um, $72 million to correcting sewage problems on their side of the border on that side of the river, the Rio Bravo. The second location is the Friendship Park in the San Diego sector. Local residents have worked really hard over the last uh, couple of decades to keep a binational spirit around the place, which was the whole point of the park in the first place, um, including binational uh, activities, a binational garden, um, that type of thing. I mentioned this place earlier because it's the place, the location of the non-existent mouse that started the waivers of law. Unfortunately, uh, in part because of that, there are now two 18-foot walls that run smack into the Pacific Ocean. Having built them, not in compliance with any law, <clears throat> they didn't notice that the, apparently the, the ocean air causes corrosion. Who knew? Um, and now uh, some part of the walls are corroding and for safety reasons, the administration recently announced that they would be replacing those walls, but they said they were going to replace them under the same contract that exists that was cut earlier with two 30-foot walls. It was a huge outcry from that community. Now, I have to say there's been a lots of huge outcries from a lot of communities, tribes, et cetera, all along the border. And to date, um, again, with the exception of Laredo, uh, those have been ignored. But recently, uh, the commissioner's office announced a pause in construction uh, that was scheduled to start within a couple of weeks of that announcement. And the pause is specifically for consultation with the community the community has engaged professional architects who are donating their time and have developed a uh, model for immediate uh, use in terms of um, possible alternatives, which does not include 30-foot walls. Um, it's pretty clear that there will, the barriers, some barriers will remain for now, but work is being done to develop a much more far-sighted, truly binational uh, landscape for that place also. Um, again, harking back to Deputy Secretary's remarks this morning, he mentioned the importance of grassroots initiatives, and I think these two examples really speak to that. Not clear yet how, certainly, how either are going to turn out, particularly Friendship Park, which is very much in play right now. Uh, but it does strike me that it's interesting they're both in urban areas. What hasn't happened uh, what we haven't seen yet, even though there has certainly been a lot of work toward that goal, is that same kind of dynamic on public lands and lands where there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a whole community right there. There may be ranchers, um, people that care a lot about the public lands uh, and tribal interests on public lands, um, but uh, we haven't seen that particular kind of dynamic uh, materialize yet, although there's been a lot of work uh, trying to get there. Ambassador Salazar stated in a news conference in San Antonio earlier this year that the Dos Laredos Binational Park project is the type of project that, quote, should be imagined, envisioned, and planned up and down the 2,000 mile border. Couldn't agree more. I very much hope that that vision comes true, and I hope that the discussion at this symposium will help move that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. A sobering analysis, as well as um, 
something I think we all need to pay attention to and continue to hear. We're going to move right into our panel, um, which is going to be moderated by Dr. Sharon Wilcox, who's a senior Texas representative for the National Conservation Organization, Defenders of Wildlife, and she leads Defenders Ocelot Conservation Program and serves as a member of Defenders Interorganizational Jaguar Conservation Team. So, Dr. Wilcox, the floor is yours. All right, uh, and my mic is live. Um, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome back. Um, so we've spent much of today discussing critical ecological and social connectivity in the borderlands. And now we're going to turn to the border wall itself and discuss how these physical structures at the boundary disrupt connectivity. <coughs> My apology. First, we're going to hear today from uh, Miles Traphagen. Miles is the Borderlands Program Coordinator for the Wildlands Network. Through his work as a biologist in the region, Miles has been documenting the impacts of the border, the border wall to public lands to graphically illustrate changes to the landscape. Next, we'll hear from Lorraine Eiler. <coughs> Lorraine is a member of the Hyacet Odom Sand People and is enrolled in the Tohono Odom Nation, where she has served in a variety of council leadership roles over the last 30 years. She is an advocate of restoration and protection of ancestral lands, culture, environment, border issues, and religious and indigenous people's rights. Finally, we'll hear from Diana Hadley, Diana is the founding president of the Northern Jaguar Project, which operates a 58,000 acre wildlife preserve in Sonora, Mexico. Diana specializes in the history of land use and ecological change in the southwestern US and northern Mexico, and through her own private lands in southern Arizona, has personally experienced the impacts of the border wall. Miles, take it away. Great, thank you. Would you mind passing the cue thing there? Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's really an honor to be here, and it's been a very inspiring session. Probably the best conference I've been to uh, in a couple of years. So. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. Yeah, so. <laughs> you, but I um, it's been wonderful. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the border wall, and we've seen some images, um, but what I'm going to do is provide an overview of what the border wall is, uh, describe what a pedestrian wall is, what vehicle barrier is, um, and also show where it was built and uh, a lot of maps and, um, and some examples of the damage. Uh, so uh, I have uh, a lot of slides and there's gonna be like 10 seconds a slide, but there's, there's no way I can convey this without quickly showing a lot of images and then we can go to questions and thing afterward. So what you're seeing here on the opening slide, uh, this is a pedestrian fence. Uh, when I first got into border walls, like as if it's my thing or something, but when I started uh, studying border walls, I never really liked the term pedestrian fence because um, I used to cross at Juarez and, and El Paso quite a bit and there was a pedestrian bridge and so I thought, oh, this facilitates pedestrian traffic and it doesn't, <laughs> it's to impede that. So what you're seeing is a bollard fence there. That's an 18 foot, so that's a, almost you know, a little more than half the size of the 30 foot ones. And they have wrapped concertina wire across that. So, uh, this is right by the Santa Cruz River um, in Arizona. So here is an overview of uh, the continent where the border wall was built. You can see that um, uh, most of Texas is unwalled at this point. Uh, it's in the lower reaches of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, uh, that uh, most of the wall construction has occurred. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on Arizona, California, and New Mexico, largely because uh, it's a whole different beast uh, there. Texas has a lot of different land dynamics and uh, as Dinah said a lot of it's been built away from um, the actual border. Uh, in the US, there's a thing called the Roosevelt Reservation established by Theodore Roosevelt in 1906. And that goes from the Rio Grande at Sunland Park, New Mexico, all the way out to San Diego, Tijuana, where Friendship Park is. And uh, that has been demarcated by uh, various structures, which I'll show you. Um, in that 60 foot zone, the federal government has authority to use that however they see fit. Here is Arizona, where our, I'm sorry, here it's Arizona, New Mexico, and California, where 458 miles of border wall were built between 2017 and 2021. Uh, there's various colors here that are color-coded for, you know, Trump-era ones, which are the uh, red ones, uh, which dominate, 
and then green, which was the existing barriers that were there. And then there's also um, some vehicle barriers, such as 63 miles on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. Here we have Arizona. You can see that 63% uh, of the whole state is walled off. That's 233 miles. In New Mexico, 106 miles were built. 59% uh, of, uh, of the state uh, it, uh, has been walled off. And in California, there's been 162 miles and 72% of the state. So uh, these three states have been heavily impacted by the border wall. Now let's do a quick history of border barriers. So if you look in the upper left-hand corner, that's the first markers that they established at the, after the Treaty of Hidalgo in uh, 1848. And these are quite rare to find. When I come across one, I get kind of excited. Um, and uh, this is in the San Rafael Valley. So uh, shortly thereafter, you know, 40 years later, um, when they did the second boundary survey uh, with Merns and a lot of these noted naturalists that a lot of scientists know about, they established the obelisks. And there are currently 278 of these. And those start at the Rio Grande and end in Tijuana. And they are not at a predetermined distance, but rather line of sight. So if the theory is using triangulation, that if you're standing at one border monument, you can look down the line left and right, and you'll know where you are on the border. Now this picture, uh, the 1891-94, is interesting because you see the progression of uh, the border obelisk, Monument 111. Uh, then you had the 1909 cattle fence, and then you have the vehicle barrier. Um, then you start to see little fences up here. Then we get the Normandy barriers in 2007, 2008. And they call that Normandy because we've all seen these on the beaches of, of Normandy. Uh, then they started using surplus materials to create fence. And so you see this one that says Zone 24. Uh, these were constructed of surplus military materials, such as landing mats from the Vietnam War that they would lay down in terrain that you needed a flat surface to uh, land a vehicle. Then you see the integrated fixed towers, which are the electronic virtual wall, uh, which came up over the last decade. Mm -hmm. And then um, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner two examples of vehicle barriers. That's a bollard barrier and then the Normandy barrier. This is in the San Bernardino Valley. Um, you've often heard replacement fencing, and it was quite enraging to hear in the media whether it was either right or left, but by and large the left was trying to beat the Trump administration down and say, oh, no new fencing was actually built. It's simply replacement. Well, here's replacement. Um, you've got vehicle barrier on the left. Wildlife can get through that. And then you get 18 and then 30 foot wall. That's sort of like calling uh, the Hiroshima atomic bomb a replacement bomb for conventional. Here's some other examples of the bollard fencing and the border patrol racing to see what I'm doing there. Um, <laughs> The picture in the upper right is kind of sad because this is the San Bernardino Valley looking towards the Pelham Seals, and you'll see a picture shortly that shows what it looks like now. Um, I want to pause real quick and talk about something that, um, that Dinah um, had mentioned about waiving the laws and uh, not contacting the local landowners and even the agencies. Um, the maps that you've seen, um, you can't find those GIS layers on any .gov website. Go and look up any solar project, wind, any public works project, and you'll find that information there. There's a NEPA process. You can go and download things. Uh, CBP, DHS never did that. Um, I'm not trying to take credit here for this, but I made all of those maps. When they first announced the projects, I pulled an all-nighter in my van down by the river and produced these GIS files based upon their latitude, longitude coordinates, which were very sloppy. Um, being a GIS professional, um, I quickly saw that the east-west boundaries did not go 270090 degrees, but rather 268 some places, 269. So basically, they were probably developed in Stephen Miller's underground lair using Google Earth. <laughs> so I made a lot of the corrections there, including a lot of points that were in Mexico, and produced maps. So when you see a map that is in National Geographic, High Country News, or something like that, that was made in a van down by the river because DHS did not provide that, and they still have not provided any of that information to this day. So this is sort of like, you know, watchdog type of stuff. Um, there's also primary and secondary walls, meaning it's a double fence. Um, this is not good. 
Here is the San Bernardino Valley picture taken in roughly the same spot. Um, on the left, I'm using a telephoto lens so you get a di slightly different perspective. But now we have a 30-foot wall, and we have about 400 high-intensity stadium lights there, which they have not turned on. But being in one of the darkest places in the lower 48, and uh, the valley, which has been documented in a paper last year of having the most pollinators in North America uh, concentration, what would happen if they turn on these lights? It's going to be a disaster. This is an ideal place for sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the distance, um, note that, that it kind of looks like mining scars, and that's in uh, Diana's beloved uh, Guadalupe Canyon. Um, people say, <laughs> yeah, wildlife can get across the border. Um, I'm sure everybody here in Colorado has seen plenty of black bears in their lives. That black bear doesn't look very happy. Mm -hmm. um, it really doesn't. Right. The border wall has proved to be uh, an impediment to wildlife recovery and binational recovery. The Mexican Gray Wolf Binational Recovery Program has been in place for over 20 years, both Mexican and US agencies. In 2017, a wolf came out of Chihuahua and made a 600 mile journey over a period of 32 days. It crossed the border uh, east of uh, Palomas in Columbus, New Mexico, went through the grasslands, crossed I-10, and then spent a couple days in Las Cruces uh, in, the, in a Catholic church pecan orchard. Um, there were a lot of lost cat signs that week. Um, and then it spent a few days on um, Mount Cristo El Rey, uh, right at Monument One above El Paso and Juarez. And then it returned back home. And uh, nobody saw the wolf. This was from GPS satellite tracking collar, courtesy of the Mexican Recovery Program. Now, here's a tale of two wolves. Um, the second wolf, oh, I misspelled tail, but anyways. Um, so uh, there's a wolf that they were calling Mr. Goodbar, and probably a lot of people heard about this wolf. Well, the opposite happened. This came out of the Gila Mountains, and it made its way over to exactly the same path of the other wolf, which I find that just fascinating. You know. What's going on there with that, you know, that telepathy between the animals or habitat selection? But you can see what happened. This is the blue line. It made its way southwest. It went along the wall for about 15 miles, realized I can't get through here, and then it returned to the Gila uh, later to get its um, leg shot off. But uh, Mr. Goodbar is okay now and has now, um, I guess, sired some, some new wolves. Here's what's happening to our public lands, our protected areas. This is San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge, the headwaters of the Rio Yaqui, uh, directly adjacent to the properties that Cuenca Los Ojos manages and uh, that uh, Valerie Gordon spoke of earlier. Um, this is called Robertson Cienega. Um, there's um, eight different native fishes that live there. Look at the vehicle barrier fence. This is in 2017. You can see that if, now that you know what a bollard vehicle fence looks like. Here's what it looked like last year. Now we've got a 30-foot wall, a road there, and due to the groundwater pumping from a well two miles west that uh, tapped into uh, artesian well aquifers that have flowed for thousands of years, fossil water that uh, hydrologists have dated between five and 20,000 years to recharge, it actually comes out warm because it's slightly thermal. Uh, they couldn't maintain the flow to this. So the refuge had to do some triage and um, select which ponds that they were gonna keep and which ones that they were gonna have to, um, to dismantle. So the flow stopped here. So basically, you know, uh, we're inflicting death upon our public lands. This is Coronado National Memorial at the foot of the Huachucas. Hard to tell the scale here, but look, look at that. Um, the crest of that is the start of the Arizona Trail. This is a national trail. Um, they blasted away uh, a National Park Service property in order to get access to build a little piece of border wall up there. There we see Guadalupe again. Um, just, I, I realized I didn't have a slide with perspective of how tall the wall is. Um, a lot of people are dying and getting uh, severely injured in San Diego um, by climbing the wall. The trauma centers have been filled there lately. They get more people with border wall injuries than gunshot wounds, and that's saying something for America. You know, so. This is Guadalupe Canyon. Um, uh, what's the name of this piece? Well, the, the, the uh, guys, the contractors who were doing this work 
called it Shadow Mountain because it's, it was never had a name before. It's just another cliff. But it had sh shade on all sides. It didn't matter where the sun was, what time of day it was, it still was a shadow. Well, you see they blasted away uh, to maintain the line of scrimmage. Instead of doing like the Chinese did where they used canyons and mountains and everything as uh, pre-existing walls, they chose at 40, 50 million dollars a mile to blast through this. Right. Only to leave a small stretch of wall about 200 meters long at the top of this, which was, I, I call it a racist stake in the ground that we're leaving this here and we're coming back. So uh, I'm not gonna leave uh, the rainbow, sunny rainbow slide. This is the last slide here, um, but um, I think it's important. Um, 2017 is the point on the right. This is Border Patrol apprehensions. Um, when they announced the border wall projects, immigration rates were at their lowest in 40 years that the Border Patrol have been recording. And you can see they were on a precipitous decline. And uh, then they announced that they need to build these border walls. I didn't include this year's statistics because I would have had to scale the y-axis double and it wouldn't look nearly uh, correct. So uh, I'll just leave you with that to chew on that uh, America's not managing by the data or numbers anymore. And for scientists to say, I don't do politics, this is all about politics. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, next we will hear from Lorraine. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about the, about the Thousand Autumn uh, Nation. Um, the Thousand Autumn, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is 2.8 million acres, and it borders uh, Mexico with 62 miles. Um, uh, it's a population of about 34,000, uh, with maybe over 2,000 uh, that live in Mexico. And the reason for that is because the uh, aboriginal lands of the autumn went from the Phoenix to uh, down to Hermosillo, from the San Pedro to the Colorado River. So you can see where all the autumn land uh, uh, used to be. And so we do have people that live um, on, on both sides, both sides of, the, of the border. Um, <coughs> the, the wall that everybody calls the border wall there's no word for, for the word wall in autumn. There's a lot of words that in autumn that uh, are, are in English that we don't have words for. And so, uh, so it's, it's, it's something that uh, we don't approve of. And one of the things on, on, on the reservation is that uh, they absolutely opposed the wall. They refused to allow the government to put a high wall on the reservation. And so they did come up with the Bollards and the Normandy, which, which allows for passage for, for uh, animals and people, and also for the storms. When the storm happens, the water that rushes through uh, will completely take down uh, whatever's, whatever's in its path. And so uh, I can say that for the nation, uh, one of the things that, that uh, everybody agreed on was there will be no border wall. And uh, the saying is, over my dead body. Uh, I believe uh, our, our morning speaker, uh, Roland Jose, was one of the ones that, that echoed that, over my dead body. And so um, I can say that we just have those uh, two types of walls, and so uh, uh, also the the autumn, um, you know, have survived for centuries and centuries on on, on this arid desert as it's described. Uh, but really, it is a very lush desert, and they have so much traditional knowledge of, of the of the total environment, so they knew how to survive. Otherwise, if they didn't have that knowledge, they wouldn't have survived. And it always amazes me when I go to conferences of all the science and all the research and all the, all the things that, 
that go into studies and whatnot, and also in areas where they do uh, 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 conservation, uh, uh, that finally, at some point in time, sometimes they will utilize methods that the tribes that live in the area used to use hundreds of years ago. When they have failed in their own ways of trying to do something, they would then go to the tribes and utilize the, the, those methods. But it still seems to me that it is very hard for the outside public to, to realize that Atham, who may not have all the degrees, still have a lot more knowledge about their environment. There are many, many different um, ways of disruption that the border wall uh, placed the autumn in. And what one is, you know, the, the, because they, they live on both sides. They have relatives on both sides. They have their ceremonies that, that uh, they go to in Mexico. They can't, sometimes, sometimes they have difficulties crossing uh, just to go visit relatives. Um, uh, ceremonies that, that's performed in Mexico because for, for, for a long time, in the 20s and 30s, the early 1900s, uh, the government and missionaries stopped a lot of the different types of ceremonies on the reservation. And so therefore, we only have those ceremonies now in Mexico. So a, n a number of the people do go down there for those ceremonies. Uh, that also has, that border wall also has hindered them their crossing. For simple health care, for those people that are members of the tribe that live in Mexico that have to cross into the United States for care at, at, the, at, the, at their hospital in, in on the reservation, sometimes they're hindered by, uh, by all the reasons that they don't have the proper documentation or whatever it takes to come across. But they are members of the tribe. They have proven that they are of them, so they are members of the tribe. But they still have difficulties crossing. So also we have runners. We have spiritual runners that, and, and when I talk about runners, I, I'm talking about an area that, uh, it's around the Phoenix area, you have two tribes, two autumn tribes, who, and then uh, below that, we have another tribe, Akchin Reservation. And then with the Thon Autumn Nation, uh, we have spiritual runners that, go, that come from all those areas to the border, and they go on their way to the Sea of Cortez. This is a, this is a ritual that the tribe has practiced for, for many, many years. This is a ritual that the young man that is seeking their manhood that, that go on these journeys. And so with the border wall, it has, it has created problems. Um, we just celebrated something uh, last year and uh, uh, it was difficult to do that because, uh, because of all the gates that, that are out there, that are, they're all closed and we had asked for a specific gate to be at a certain place, and of course, it, there's none. So we had to go to another area in order, in order to even come together with, with Autumn from the villages in Mexico and also to the different reservations and meet right at the border wall. And so, um, fortunately for us, we were allowed, they did open up the, the fence, I mean the gates, and uh, we stood on one side and they stood on the, the other side and we went ahead and did, did our ceremonies. But all these, all these things that, that, that are out there, uh, it's just, you just can't go across like they used to. And so we have all these disruptions in, which has call, caused a lot of mental anguish among the, among the autumn. And I won't even go into, um, the, the issues with the, with the plants and the animals and all the things that, that have been disrupted. But probably one of the main, one of the, one of the worst things that, that, that happened was the dis total destruction of, um, of, of uh, saguaros. Saguaros is viewed 
as a person by the tribe. They passed a, 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 a law recognizing it as a person because of its history. Um, but they literally just bulldozed huge, huge sawaras that are over 150 years old. And they just, the devastation of those, of those um, sawaros angered a lot of people. And what even further angered them was that some of the contractors picked up some of those sawaros and were trying to, trying to sell them. And luckily, people that they were trying to sell them to did inform the, 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 the law and the nearest community of where they were trying to sell. And so, um, as I understand it, when I last asked about where they were at, they were still looking into it. So, as you can imagine, they'll be looking into it for the rest of their lives, I would imagine. But, but um, it angered people so much that they went out and protested protested because of the fact that they were not allowed to go into an area, a sacred area, sacred springs, uh, where they could practice their, their, their religion. And so we got a lot of feedback from that, and um, you know, why, 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 uh, why is this so sacred? And to us, and to us it is a very sacred place because we have been going there for years doing our, our, our ceremonies and our prayers and whatnot. And so it's, it's, like, it's like all the destruction that's around there um, probably equates to uh, somebody knocking down the, the cathedral, national cathedral, or maybe going over the national cemetery and just bulldozing it. And that's, that was the feeling of, of, of the young people that, that went out and protested. And because they protested, they ended up in jail and were, were likely to be sentenced um, uh, for long periods of time. But I can say that, thank goodness, even though the judge at, at first uh, uh, said they were guilty at a second, at a second time, um, the same judge, I believe, um, uh, recognized the fact that this person was only trying to practice their religious uh, uh, practices and so things did come out okay so uh, but it's just total devastation for the autumn to see all the destruction all the things that um, uh, all the laws that were broken and all the th all the things that they were not allowed to to do and to practice and to whatnot and it, it it's it's uh, it's one of those things that um, they found ways around it to, to, to do that uh, because certainly all the, any wall that you put up, it's not gonna stop people. And I'll just share a little story, um, even though I'm going uh, along uh, quite a ways. Uh, we were, we were cere celebrating at one of our ceremonies and we were looking over this pond and, and uh, there was singing going on and um, here was here were this mud turtles that came out, came out when singing singing was happening, and there was a, a number of tribes that had gotten together, and here were the mud turtles just singing. I mean, just dancing to the to the to the singing, and that and that to me was or to us, uh, but to me particularly, reminded me the reason why I was there, and the reason I was there was to speak for not only the humans but also for all the plants and all the animals that were around there that, that had been disturbed. Thank you. Thank you, and finally we'll hear from Diana. Okay. So, is that that's how? No, that's the big green one. That's the big green one. Oh, that one, okay. <laughs> Yeah, go back. Yeah. Oh, I'm. I, how do I go back? Let's see. There we go. Okay. So this is from the point of view. It's a much more informal talk, I think, <laughs> than some of the other ones. But it's from the point of view of conservation ranchers who've been on the border. This is our 50th, 50th anniversary. We've been there since 1972. And um, can you can you guys over there play the video that's 
This is what we put up with for um, six months, five months. In order to put the wall up, they did this. They blasted every day for six days a week, sometimes two or three times a day, between August of 2020 and Inauguration Day. And you can see in this part of the video what a mess they made. Inauguration Day at 10 a.m., which was noon in Washington, D.C., when Biden took office, when he became president. This was to put in a wall that they knew that they didn't have time to finish. So there isn't any wall, but there is this huge, hideous scar. And that scar causes erosion. It causes rock falls. The road to our ranch house is immediately north of where all this blasting took place. and. Um, a boulder could have rolled down and landed on top of a pickup truck. I mean, it's like not, 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 it, it, the safety issues were really extreme. And this area is immediately north of Cuenca Los Ojos, which is a major conservation area. There are immediate neighbors to the south. Okay, so let's see, I'm going on to the next. Maybe you have to take that off in order to get the slides moving again. If they are moving, but, but on the moving. That you're, but you're moving. Wait a minute, path. they're moving up here. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry, I am such a flood group. Can I go backwards? Okay, this is the trail going. This is it's 40 miles out of dirt road, and that's the trail um, going. That's the road going out to. Uh, the ranch is just a mile north of that. And this, what um, you've already seen, is the entrance to Guadalupe Canyon. So Guadalupe Canyon is um, on this side in the United States. This is the, one of the headwaters for the Yaqui River. It starts in the Animas Valley of New Mexico. It goes through Guadalupe Canyon. It empties into the San Bernardino River, and then that empties into the Cajon Bonito, and the Cajon Bonito empties into the Bavispe River, which is a huge river in, in, in Sonora, and the Bavispe runs into the Rio Yaqui, which is the largest river in northern Mexico. Okay, so this is an area looking at that shadow mountain that has really been surrounded with, uh, you, can, you, can see the, you can see the trucks working on both sides of the mountain. Okay, so well, I wanna give you a very quick history of Guadalupe. And we learned all of this after we moved to the ranch. It has archeological evidence of 2000 years of human habitation for many different cultures. It was described, the earliest dis written description of it was in a Spanish document um, dated 1695 that describes a battle between the Spanish military and 600 Apache Indians, which I think is probably an exaggeration. Um, it was mapped and described by the Royal Corps of Engineers um, by their cartographers. There are four maps of it dating from the uh, 17th and 18th century. It was described by all of the participants in the, in the border, in the wall, in the war with Mexico, the um, Intervención um, North, North Americano, as it's called in, in Mexico. I don't like calling it the Mexican War. Um, it's also described in three boundary surveys where they talk about, Emory's Boundary Survey talks about um, a jaguar being found in Guadalupe Canyon. Um, Emory's Border Survey, they had to re redo the border um, 
delineation because it wasn't quite correct in this previous survey. It was, it was resurveyed by Emory in 1855, and that survey talks about, um, about the, a bear in Guadalupe Canyon, and, and it also talks about a jaguar in Guadalupe Canyon. There was another resurvey in 92 and ni between 92 and 94, and that talks about Mexican grizzlies on the Animas Valley that were starving to death because that survey was conducted while there was one of the worst droughts in the history of Arizona and New Mexico. And um, then in, in the period between uh, 1910 and 1920, oh my gosh, I'm not even started. Between 1910 <laughs> and 1920, there were homesteads and that was, the, that was what initiated the ranch that we're in. And as you probably know, um, all the ranches in the Southwest have um, public land attached to them. When you sell a property, you sell it with, your, with, with the lease attached, whether it's Forest Service or BLM or state, or state land. And so what has happened with the ranching on the, on the border, it's complicated already because you have to combine your management policies with, um, you have to combine your management policies with these other agencies. And so you have many layers of, uh, of different management uh, strategies to go through. And the border wall has just simply um, added to that. Now, in the, in the course of looking at the science and the ecology in the canyon, all of these different designations have come up. So it's an outstanding natural area and it has three different recognition, that's um, by the BLM. It has four different uh, study areas for wilderness, and it has a wilderness uh, study area with the Forest Service as well, and it is a zoological and, and uh, botanical um, area for the Forest Service, and it's an important birding area for uh, the Audubon uh, Society because so many b migratory birds come up from Mexico and don't go anyplace else. Um, the, the, it's definitely a major, a major crossing point. It was in the Spanish period called a, a, commun a Camino Real or a, um, a royally supported highway. Um, it is incredibly rich in all kinds of biological species. You can see two bear cubs in that uh, tree on the left. And there are linkages that came about, um, recognized linkages that came about through conversations between all of the different organizations that are studying the, um, the connectivity and the migratory routes for all kinds of, of uh, mammals. So the, in, the, in, in this map, the jaguar sightings are marked in little red dots. Um, this was defined in, in 2000, 2003 or four, and I think it's been, re, re, it's been refined a great deal since then. So what I wanna talk about is private land in Mexico and the connection that got put together in my head and in Carlos Lopez, who's a a jaguar um, a scientist in, at the University of Queretaro who initiated this whole project. Um, we, we started with one ranch in Sonora, 110 miles south of the border. And it was a ranch that cost $200,000. And that was the price of a tract home in Tucson at the time. A nice one, but a tract home with no property going with it. So we started this project to create a reserve, starting with that one ranch, and expand, it's expanded today to 58,000 acres. And we've also got a program with all of the um, ranches surrounding the reserve where we provide monetary rewards for the four major felines. Here you see that it's like due south of, of Douglas. If anybody wants to visit it, let me know. <laughs> and we arrange tours. In any case, uh, we've had 2,000 photographs of, of jaguars and other, uh, other of the forest feline species. Um, 
83 individual jaguars and uh, on both the ranches and on the reserve itself. We focus on these four different felines and we give these monetary rewards for each one, 5,000 pesos for a jaguar, 1,500 for an ocelot, um, 1,000 for a mountain lion, and don't you love this mountain lion not getting her feet wet, and, um, <laughs> and 500 pesos for a bobcat. And if they don't want the financial reward, we, we give rewards with uh, different kinds of projects. We do, uh, we place gabions to uh, reduce erosion, and we make, we build outhouses for different ranches, and we supply water tanks, so they get something that benefits them, but also benefits the wildlife in the area. Um, since 1996, we've had at least seven jaguars who have crossed and had been documented in photographs in different parts of Arizona and, and, and New Mexico. And El Jefe just reappeared after he disappeared from the Santa Rita Mountains. He reappeared in central Sonora, and we have no idea when he left Arizona and went down to central Sonora, but that's like where he was discovered and nobody really knows or, or we're not publicizing, they're not publicizing which mountain range in Sonora he was from, but that is um, seven years and he's, he returned to Mexico. Recently, we have photographs of two young male jaguars that are in Sonora that are on the, probably on the Cuenca Los Ojos properties. All, they're, they're protected in, in Cuenca Los Ojos. They are ready to return to, they are ready to return to former habitat in the United States and making that possible is really, really important. Um, there's that poor bear on the wall again <laughs> and the gates. It's no longer possible for the bear to even get where he is because now the wall is 12 feet higher than it was when that photograph was taken. And the gates, I wanted to mention that the Guadalupe and the San, and the San Bernardino are in the Rio Yaqui watershed. If we had followed John Wesley Powell's advice about how the states in the United States were divided up and they were divided up by watershed, we wouldn't be here. We would be in Mexico. We'd be a northernmost state in Mexico because all of our waters flow south. These gates open to the north. That means that when we have a flood event, the water piles up on these gates and in the recent monsoons last summer, all of the gates were completely dislodged, pulled off their hinges, and it was a monument to poor planning. Um, the additional challenge that I wanted to mention, and there are organizations that are working on this, is that the Mexico Route 2, which connects um, San Luis Rio Colorado with um, Palomas, um, is, has been a two-lane paved highway, and it's now being expanded to four lanes where possible and to three lanes in some areas, and four lanes with a divided median in between. And what we need to do, that is only two, between one and four miles south of the border. So any animals that are trapped between Route 2 and the border wall are really in, a, you know, they're in a, a deadly area, they're trapped. And so getting um, some type of underpasses or overpasses on Mexico Route 2 is really critical. And since the highway already has culverts, and Mexico builds beautiful culverts, some of them are rocks that, that are beautifully with a, you know, keystone, beautiful stone arches, underneath the road. I don't have a photograph of one of those, but they're, they're wonderful and they're big enough for a buck with antlers or a couple of jaguars to cross at the same time. We need more of those and we need any kind of barricades taken out of those uh, under, 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 under road crossing points. Hopefully that can be managed with some kind of conversation with a 
Federal Transportation Department in Mexico. Anyway, this is, the, this is a, a, a nice picture of what could really preserve linkages between the wildlife, and maybe something like this can be done with the border wall. Or at least the doors can be left open, the gates can be left open year long, and the lights can remain unlighted. That's so important for avian migra migration, and it's really important for um, animals like uh, cats who do not want to be spotlighted in the middle of the night. Thank you. Thank you to each of our speakers who shared incredibly impactful stories and images that really spotlight how incredibly impactful the wall itself is. And we're gonna move right into our questions now. We've seen some really stunning imagery today on um, the impacts of the wall on the landscape and the variation of border wall construction along the boundary. We're curious to hear more about how variation in design might affect communities, animals, landscapes, and water in different ways. Um, are there d certain constructions that maybe favor communities or animals and their migratory patterns more than others? Are there some that, I think we already can see the answer to this, um, stand out more as being harmful? Um, Miles, would you like to start us? Well, um, you know, in politics and economics and a lot of arenas like that, um, you can find middle ground and compromise. Um, but uh, in the case of border walls, uh, like bollard fences, um, there's really no compromise. Um, the only way you can go about doing that is actually have places open. And there are numerous floodgates along um, the border. Uh, I would estimate there's probably, you know, a thousand. Um, over the last year, I mapped California, Arizona, New Mexico on the ground, went and ground truthed it all. And I started out uh, trying to document each gate and it be simply became too many, I couldn't do it. Um, so if those could be left open, yeah, that would facilitate wildlife movement and it would also facilitate flood control. And, um, and from a strategic tactical thing, if that's your bag, um, how do hunters work? They set up drift nets, they, um, they, they use existing holes and barriers and pathways in order to, you know, do their thing. So, um, you know, the Border Patrol has actually put themselves at a tactical disadvantage when they wall off a straight area for 100 miles. Now they have to guard the entire thing versus experienced agents knew how to work the land. So there's just really no way to compromise uh, design other than leaving things open. Uh, Diana. Well, design, I'm gonna go back to like a really basic thing. If you're, if you're Homeland Security and you can be designing the border protection for protection, for prevention of crossing, for apprehension of crossers, and for capture of crossers. Okay, so if you really want to catch the people who are crossing the border, what you need is some kind of, of technological observation through cameras and, and alert systems. And then you need more people on the ground. The Douglas sector, which goes from Douglas, Arizona, like 40 miles east to the New Mexico border, and I think it has something on the, on the west side of the town too, used to have something like 600 or 700 border patrol agents. It's now down to 300. And we miss them because they were really great for helping you change a tire or you know <laughs> that, that, that kind of information. Um, the whole design is not right for what, for any of these, for any of these elements. It doesn't prevent crossers and it doesn't as Miles was just saying, it doesn't facilitate apprehension. What you need is the technological um, detection methods, and then you need to have more boots on the ground or more horse hooves on the ground because mounted border agents are what started with the Chinese Exclusion Act when the Border Patrol got going was to prevent Chinese people who were excluded from Mexico from coming into, into the United States. So 
the whole design is wrong from the get-go. The wall doesn't work, we know that, and it should be torn down. And as far as design goes, there are something like 4,000 bollards, which is a weird word for what these things are really posts. They're steel, they're like six by six inches, they're filled with cement, and you can cut through them when they're standing with a, with a skill saw that you get from Ace Hardware. I mean, this is like not hard to get through. And there are all kinds of, of methods of putting mattresses over the concertina wire and mattresses on the ground for landing. It doesn't work for, for crossing. But anyway, the design to go back to the beginning what are we going to do with all of these extra bollards that are everywhere if they're really not going to rebuild the wall? And I would love to see a, a, a national contest started for the best idea of what you can do with 30 feet of cement-filled um, posts. Where can they go? You can cut them up so they can be used in small pieces. Any, any ideas? I think this would be a great advertising issue for <laughs> what to do with the remainders of the wall. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lorraine? What you can do with those walls? Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing they did before they built those walls. Is When the contractors came in, they pushed the Normandy, some of the Normandy fences into Mexico. Yeah. Yep. Guess what? <laughs> the cartels came and picked them all up, and so they're barricaded. <laughs> it's our little repayment for all the destruction we've done on the Mexican so, side of the border. So you <laughs> knock down that wall, or Mother Nature, when Mother Nature knocks it down, I'm sure it'll probably hopefully go into Mexico. Yeah, yeah. And so we don't have to worry about it because the cartels will then again come in and, 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 and take it. But you see, the wall now is, anyway, the, few, the last time I was there was, uh, was a month ago. But I had been going there like every two or three weeks. And every time I went there, the, the gates were just wide open. And this was even before the monsoons. Once the monsoons came, when I went out there, the gates were like twisted. Twickle. <laughs> All twisted. And so, yeah. what can I say? Dinah, would you like to share your thoughts? Uh, well, I think the, um, the, the most important design difference is between the, the uh, vehicle barriers and any form of pedestrian wall. Um, there were some legitimate reasons and would remain some legitimate reasons for vehicle barriers. I never heard anybody objecting to those uh, strenuously. Um, and it matters not if the style is a bit different on pedestrian walls, they are bad in many, many ways. Uh, even the gates, I mean, I think, yes, it's better to have the gates open for wildlife crossings. It would be better to remove them so you don't have to go deal with the twisted gates and the all that problem, and um, there also were, was a uh, internationally renowned hydrologist who went down and took a look at the wall in southeast Arizona and also in the Rio Grande Valley uh, for various reasons and noted that not only did the gates open to the north, <laughs> he couldn't believe that, but uh, they were too narrow to allow even obvious uh, trees that were standing nearby that were um, taken down by the monsoon to get through. So it was just causing more of a backup of vegetation. I mean, there was like nothing right about them. Um, so at the very least, they should be taken down and I concur with all the comments about, you know, gates open and lights off. Um, but the superior design by far is vehicle barrier. Thank you. So folks are curious, does the wall look different on public versus tribal versus private lands? And how do these different types of land ownership affect the border wall's impact? The only real, I mean, there used to be a lot of different kinds of wall and some miles, some of the miles slides showed some of that. Um, so at one time we had like 
you know, six different styles, so to speak, of pedestrian wall along the border. Um, now it's much more uniform in California, Arizona, and New Mexico, either the 18-foot or the 30-foot uh, bollard walls in most places. The only real difference in design anywhere is in the Rio Grande Valley, the lower Rio Grande Valley, uh, because of the levee situation. Um, they can't put the engineers, <laughs> as much as uh, some of the political folks wanted, could not figure out a way to put the wall in the middle of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo River, <laughs> uh, or even on the immediate banks. Um, so they set it back, and it literally is a mile or two into the United States. What we're giving up is a lot of wildlife refuge tracks. Uh, there's 144 tracks of the lower Rio Grande National Wildlife Refuge. All of those are either wall, well, there's about eight or 10, I think, that are further north, but most of those are either walled or are slated to be walled with that leftover border wall funding. The entire Rio Grande Valley would be walled. So you're losing many, many, many acres of wildlife refuge. Same with the private lands. There's no different design on private lands at all. Uh, the only difference about the private lands is that the government has to go through eminent domain procedures. Uh, the waiver authority doesn't waive the Constitution. The first draft, which I saw, did. <laughs> uh, but somebody in Congress figured out they couldn't actually waive the Constitution. Part of what it, one of the things in the Constitution is the right of the government to take private property for eminent domain, but the responsibility to pay some compensation. As you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, dispute about what fair and just compensation is. And there is a statute that's been utilized on all the border wall takings that allows them to take landowners' land and then quibble about the amount of money later. So there were uh, over 100 uh, eminent domain cases uh, so far in the Rio Grande Valley. This administration's canceled a few of them, but if they actually have to build the remaining uh, 88 miles and totally wall up the Rio Grande Valley, there will be hundreds of more filed. But there's no different design. It's the same design. Thank you. And I'll let Lorraine speak to tribal, but um, of course the nation does not have anything, fortunately, other than vehicle barriers. Uh, the Sun Mountain Nation, you know, has has the two types, as you mentioned earlier, the Bullets and the, and the Normandy, and and um, uh, while they've been cut. Uh, and they no longer have the, the, a lot of the main problems that they had, uh, which was stopping vehicle barriers, um, because they were all over the land, not just on the nation, but on on the public land, BLM land, uh, Oregon Pike, and Cabeza Prieta, and the wilderness areas. Uh, cars were found in areas that people wondered how they got in there, but left and abandoned. So you found a lot of cars that were left out in, in hard to get into places, and uh, not only cars, but also tires, uh, uh, cans <coughs> of, of uh, gasoline cans that, that were dumped all over the place. And so uh, at least it has stopped all that. Um, but, but they can still, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are pictures of how they can still come across in, in vehicles, but um, that, that has seemed to have ceased uh, quite a bit, and so, uh, and, and people do still cross all, all over the place. And one thing I'll say about uh, the, the Border Patrol is that they are not on the border. <coughs> so I don't know why they call them Border Patrol because they are anywhere from 40 to 60 to 80 miles Tucked away down. from the border. <coughs> they are on the roads, in cars, running all over the place. They are <coughs> on ATVs, disrupting the land. They are in drones that fly all over the place, helicopters that fly all over the place. They are not on the border, and that's where they need to be, on the border. But they always come up with all kinds of excuses. So, yeah. One of the most popular um, car stickers I saw when I first moved to Arizona was, <coughs> in southern Arizona, was defend the border at the border. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Um, we are running short on time, but briefly, I'd like to hear from our other, other two panelists on that point. Um, if you could just constrain your comments to a couple minutes each. Yeah, um, you know, I think that we've kind of belabored that point a bit. And there, there's a, a theme that I, I've heard I really wanted to acknowledge, and, and, and Valerie Gordon said that earlier when she was talking about flyover country and the borderlands. Um, and it's really not the borderlands. That word is, is loaded to begin with. Um, in the last few years, I think of it as the heartland of North America. Mm. It's the land where the jaguar and the black bear share the same path. Those are two North American iconic species. Mm -hmm. You know, one's reaching its northern limit from the south, from the neotropics, the other one's a temperate species, and they're overlapping there. You can mm -hmm. be on the desert floor with a saguaro and look up to the mountains and see a ponderosa pine. So this is the, the blending of cultures, it's the blending of languages, it's the blending of food, and I think that it's, it's about time that we we really say that this is the heartland. The heartland is not the one that starts east of DIA. It's been defined by Pepperidge Farm commercials and stuff, or you know, <laughs> w when uh, the bison have been removed and the prairie sod has been tilled up and now it's planted with GMO corn and soybeans yeah. and wheat. You know, how do you call that the heartlands? No, the heartland is right there in the borderlands where everything is converging. I think that was a good place to end, but I just want to say the way that the wildlife get trapped between Route 2 in Mexico and the border wall, um, people's ranches, ranchettes, or small farms get trapped in Texas between the actual banks of the Rio Grande and where the border wall had to be put because the floodplain is too squishy for the for the bollards to get posted in um, securely. And there, there even have been examples of people who had fires mm -hmm. in their barns. And the fire, the fire department from Laredo or where, whatever town was nearest didn't have the key to get through the wall to save this piece of property. They lost their livestock. They lost the barn building. I mean, it's terrible to be trapped. And when you think of humans being trapped like that, I think we need to transfer our understanding to wildlife being trapped in the same way and preventing that horror of knowing that there's water just across the border, but you can't get to it. And that can happen to wildlife on the north side or the south side of the wall. It shouldn't be there. Thank you. And I would like to thank all of our panelists. We do not have time for the optimism question. So I invite you <laughs> during our reception. Um, as you can see, there was a richness of questions that we didn't have a chance to address. Please do approach them um, if they are present at the reception. Um, I'm sure you can have some very uh, thoughtful conversations about the issues raised here this afternoon and throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to that esteemed panel. That's, uh, it's always, again, sobering and, and somewhat encouraging to understand the challenges that are in front of us. And I don't know, how many folks out there are fans of Saturday Night Live? Anybody ever watch it? Maybe the new season, the old season? Did you, anybody catch the reference up here from a GIS professional? Were you paying attention closely? Living in a van down by the river? Nobody got that? And now let's layer cake on top of that. Is anybody familiar with the hashtag van life? out there on Instagram for all your social media fans. So in my day, it was a Florida Connell line van. I have some old Outward Bound instructors in the audience as well, shag carpeting inside. It was not an economically viable choice to do that. It was because you had to do that. That's what you could afford. And now, $120,000 later in a Mercedes Sprinter van, um, the proposition is different. So again, I echo this juxtaposition within um, our ecosystem that it's amazing how people choose to activate and engage um, in, in our wild places. And thank you for the Saturday Night Live reference. That was, that was powerful. Um, so to bring us to the end of our day, I'm the only thing standing between you and uh, b a beverage of your choice. And Beth reminded me to remind you in the back of your little card doodad holder, there are not one but two drink coupons. Not one, two. 
And the uh, happy hour will take place both here and on the patio directly outside um, that door. If you haven't felt the warmth of the day on your skin yet, it's a gorgeous afternoon. So please take some time to enjoy the fresh air. So lastly, but certainly not least, I want to introduce somebody um, very special to me and our team at VF. Um, Ms. Gloria Schock is our executive director of the VF Foundation, and she's also the senior director of Global Impact. And um, when we started this journey of understanding um, what philanthropic impact looked like for our collection of brands um, and VF as a uh, parent company, um, Gloria has really come in and helped to shape the foundation into truly um, a, a global entity um, of massive scale and impact. So without any further ado for a really fun, exci exciting announcement, Gloria, come on up. Thank you for that generous introduction, Luis. Isn't he an amazing MC? It just comes very naturally to him, right? So let's give him the a hand. So I just want to thank everyone for being here today and for elevating the, the conversation around climate action and conservation. And I really just want to also thank Beth Conover and her extraordinary team for their leadership and passion for this work and the work that they're doing day in and day out to advance um, this conservation work um, across, across the globe. So um, as Luis mentioned, the VF Foundation is the philanthropic grant-making arm of VF um, to be a force for good in the world, particularly in the communities where VF operates. And it's with our valued partners with a collaborative approach that we're looking to innovate and problem solve on some of the greatest issues that we face with a shared vision to create a more equitable and sustainable world. So two years ago at the Salazar Center's second annual symposium, I had announced a new partnership between the VF Foundation and the Center to launch the Thriving Cities Challenge Incentive Prize. Today, I'm thrilled to announce that the program has evolved out of that effort, is the new Peregrine Accelerator for Conservation Impact. So the center learned a few things by running the Thriving Cities Challenge and Connectivity Challenge. Together, those two competitions attracted nearly 100 team proposals from across the US, Canada, and Mexico, which were evaluated by over 70 volunteer peer evaluators and resulted in 16 awards between 10,000 to 100,000 for a total of 600,000 for the implementation of innovative approaches to big challenges related to conservation and equity community development. Lessons learned from the remarkable teams that have participated in these programs over the past several years include the fact that the support most needed to realize innovative solutions includes wraparound resources for training, mentorship, and cultivation of funding for projects, and peer, leaning, peer learning has also been a critical need. To that end, the Salazar Center has reimagined its incentive prize as a longer, more fully developed program to allow many participating groups to, to, be, to make it possible for, the, for it to succeed. And the new program is called the Peregrine Accelerator for Conservation Impact. So why Peregrine? Well, among other reasons, this program is all about accelerating the pace and scale of conservation innovations and the peregrine falcon is the fastest animal in North America, and its range extends throughout the continent. The bird's eye or aerial view of the falcon is also the perspective of the center in its work to promote conservation and climate resilience across landscapes and political boundaries. The accelerator program will select a cohort of up to a dozen final teams. And we hope for an equal number from the US and Mexico which will then participate in a six-month wraparound program of tailored training, mentorship, and other support to further develop proposals. Each team will receive $10,000 grant to participate, and impl implementation awards will be available at the conclusion of the process for the strongest proposals, as well as any effort to engage regional donors to support as many projects as possible. In its inaugural year, the accelerator will focus more locally than in past years on a single critical watershed, the Rio Grande Basin, or Rio Bravo, as it's called in Mexico, to facilitate peer learning and support complementary projects. 
The Rio Grande Basin covers 300,000 square miles over three U.S. states and six Mexico states, and it delineates over half of the national border. An estimated 12 to 13 million people, including residents of the eight pair of pairs of sister cities in the basin, and do dozens of indigenous and tribal communities are dependent on the river for water irrigation, as well as drinking the household consumption, environmental health, cultural activities and recreation, as well as agriculture, resource extraction, and tourism. The basin contains some of the most biodiverse ecosystems in North America, with more than 450 rare species of neotropical birds, mammals, and insects that migrate through the borderlands each year. The health and well-being of the landscapes and people in both countries are deeply intertwined with the river. You can visit the peregrineconservationimpact.org website to learn more, and applications to be part of the accelerator will open tomorrow, and we cannot wait to see what it produces in terms of the leadership and innovation for the Rio Grande and Rio Bravo Basin in the next year. So thank you so much for your time, thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference to the fullest. All right, who's ready to wrap it up? Yes? Well, thank you. It's up front, it's like, please. Can we please go stretch our legs? I agree with you, sir. Um, thank you for your time, your energy, your attention, your passion today. And if you thought today was fun, just wait till tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So please, enjoy your evening. Um, and we'll see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early, 8 a.m. Thanks a lot, everybody.